The scripture reading for this evening you can find in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians chapter 5. We'll read the whole chapter together. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought for us the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart." For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here ends the reading of God's word. We have a sermon this evening entitled, The Groans of Believers Under Their Burdens. It's a sermon preached by Reverend Ebenezer Erskine, who lived in the 1700s. It's taken from the scriptures that we read, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 4. We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. And he has four points. First, the believer's present lodging. He is in a tabernacle. Secondly, the believer's burdens in this tabernacle. Third, his groans under these burdens, and fourth, conclude with some improvement of the whole or an application. 
In the first verse of this chapter, the apostle gives a reason why he and others of the saints in his day endured persecution for the cause of Christ with such an unshaken constancy and holy nobility. He tells us that they had the prospect of better things, the solid and well-grounded hope of a happy immortality to follow upon the dissolution of this clay tabernacle of the body. You need not wonder, would he say, though we cheerfully and willingly undergo the sharpest trials for religion. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. When the poor believer can say with David, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, he will be ready to join together with the same holy man, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Yea, so far is the apostle from being damped or discouraged at the thoughts of death, that he rather invites it to do its office by striking down this clay tabernacle, that his soul may be at liberty to ascend to these mansions of glory that his blessed friend and elder brother has prepared for him above. As you see in verse 2, In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. He knew very well that when he should be stripped of his mortal body, he should not be found naked, as you see in verse 3, but clothed with a robe of glory and immortality. And in the verse read, he gives a reason why he was so desirous to change his living quarters, and it is drawn from the uneasiness and inconvenience of his present lodging. While cooped up in this clay tabernacle, we that are in this tabernacle, says he, do groan, being burdened. The observation I offer from the words is this, that believers are many times burdened, even to groaning, while in the clay tabernacle of the body. We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. And then the four points, the believer's present lodging, he is in a tabernacle, And the tabernacle is, of course, tent, right? The believer's burdens in this tabernacle, his groans under these burdens, and fourth of all, an application. The first thing is to give you some account of the believer's present lodging while in the body or where he lives in his body. It is called a house in the first verse of this chapter. And it is fitly so-called because of its meticulous and exquisite structure and workmanship. As we read in Psalm 139, verse 14 and 15, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. The body of man is an awe-inspiring piece of architecture. And the skill and wisdom of the great Creator are awe-inspiringly revealed in it. It is set up, as it were, by line and rule, in such exact order that the most skillful buildings and structures in the world are but a chaos or mass of confusion when compared with it. Take a clod of dust and compare it with the flesh of man. Unless we were instructed of it beforehand, we would not imagine it to be one and the same matter, considering the beauty and the excellency of the one above the other, which evidently proclaims the being, power, and wisdom of the great Creator who made us and not we ourselves, and who can elevate matter above its first original Also, concerning the believer's present lodging, that however ingenious its structure be, 
yet it is but a house of earth. Therefore called in the first verse an earthly house. And it is so, especially in respect to its original. It is made of earth. It is true, all the elements meet in the body of man, fire, earth, water, and air. But earth is the predominant, and it is a house of clay in respect of the means that support it. It stands upon pillars of dust for the corn, wine, and oil wherewith the body of man is maintained, all spring out of the earth. And it is a house of earth in respect of its end. It returns thither at its dissolution. Accordingly, see what God said to Adam in Genesis 3, verse 19. Dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And also, concerning the believer's present lodging, that is, that it is at best but a tabernacle. So it is called in verse 1. If our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, and again here in verse 4, we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Now a tabernacle or a tent is a movable or portable kind of habitation and is peculiar especially to two sorts of men. Tabernacles or tents are peculiar or especially used uh, to strangers and soldiers. Strangers, especially in the eastern countries, used to carry these portable houses about with them because of the inconveniences to which they were exposed. Hence it is said of Abraham that by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, or tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. They dwelt in tabernacles because they had no present inheritance. They were only strangers and passengers in the country. To this the apostle probably alludes here. And so this intimates to us that the saints of God, while in the body, are pilgrims and strangers, not as yet arrived at their own country. I am a stranger in the earth, says the psalmist David. In Psalm 119, verse 19, now also soldiers use tents, soldiers who are frequently obliged to convey their camps from one place to another also use tabernacles. Believers, while they are in the tabernacle of the body, must act the part of soldiers, fight their way to the promised land through the very armies of hell. We wrestle not, says the apostle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Thus, the believer's lodging in a tabernacle shows him to be both a traveler and a soldier. Another thing that I remark concerning the believer's lodging is that it is but a tottering house that is shortly to be taken down. For, says the Apostle in verse 1, the earthly house of this tabernacle is to be dissolved. What man is he, says the psalmist, that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? The king of terrors has erected his trophies of victory over all that ever sprung of Adam. The greatest Caesars and Alexanders who made the world to tremble with their swords, were all forced at last to yield themselves captive to this grim messenger of the Lord of hosts. There is no discharge of this warfare. The tabernacle of the body must dissolve. However, it may be ground of encouragement to the believer that death is not a destruction or annihilation. No, as the apostle tells it is only a dissolving or taking down of the tent or tabernacle for God designs to set up this tabernacle again at the resurrection, more glorious than ever. It was the faith of this that comforted and encouraged Job under his affliction 
I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, and though my reins be consumed within me, says he, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now, the second thing was to speak a little of the believer's burdens while in this tabernacle. This earthly house lies under many servitudes, and the believer, as one says, pays, as one says, pays a dear rent for his quarters. For, first of all, the clay tabernacle itself is many times a heavy burden to him. The cottage of the body is liable to innumerable pains, which makes it lie like a dead weight upon the soul, by which its liveliness and activity are exceedingly marred. When the poor soul would mount up as upon eagle's wings, the body will not do its part with it, so that the believer feels the truth of Christ's apology verified in his sad experience. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak." And secondly, not only is he burdened with a burden of clay, but also with a burden of sin. I mean, indwelling corruption, the secret atheism, enmity, unbelief, ignorance, pride, hypocrisy, and other abominations of his heart. Oh, but this is a very heavy burden, which many times is like to dispirit the poor believer and press him through the very ground. David, though a man according to God's own heart, yet cries out under this burden, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret fault. And the Apostle Paul never complains so much of any burden as of this, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? To be rid of this burden... The poor believer many times would be content that this clay tabernacle were broken into shivers. And thirdly, he is burdened many times with a sense of much actual guilt, which he has contracted through the untidiness of his way and walk. Conscience, that deputy of the Lord of hosts, being supported by the authority of the law, frequently brings in a heavy indictment against the poor soul and tells it, Thus and thus you have sinned and trampled upon the authority of God, the great lawgiver. In this case, the believer cannot but take with the charges and own with David, Mine iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. And fourthly, he is sometimes sadly burdened with the temptations of Satan. The devil, that cunning archer, shoots at him and sore wounds and grieves him. Sometimes whole showers of fiery darts dipped in hell are made to fly about his ears. God, for holy and wise ends, suffers the believer to be winnowed, sifted, and buffeted by this enemy. And oh, how much is the believer burdened in this case! But let not the believer think strangely of this, seeing Christ himself was not exempted from the molestations of his enemy. And fifthly, sometimes the believer is burdened with the burden of ill company. Ill company is bad friends or friends with a bad influence. The society of the wicked, which perhaps is unavoidable, is a great encumbrance to him and tends mightily to mar and hinder him in his work and warfare. Hence David utters that mournful and melancholy complaint, Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. The believer is of Jacob's disposition with reference to the wicked. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor be not thou united." And truly, sirs, if the company and society of the wicked be not your burden, it is a sign you are of their society. Sixthly, sometimes the believer is sadly burdened, not only with his own sins, 
but also with the abounding sins and abominations of the day and place in which he lives. I beheld the transgressors, says David, and was grieved. Rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. Oh, what a heartbreaking thing is it to the poor soul to see sinners dashing themselves to pieces upon the thick bosses of God's buckler, and as it were upon the rock of salvation, running headlong to their own everlasting ruin without ever reflecting upon their ways. His very bowels yearn with pity toward them who will not pity themselves. Upon this account, believers are frequently designated the mourners in Zion. They sigh and cry for the abominations that be done in the midst of Jerusalem. Ezekiel 9, verse 4. And seventhly, the believer is many times, while in this tabernacle, burdened with the public concerns of Christ. He is a person of a very grateful and public spirit, Christ lifted him up while he was in a low estate, and therefore he cannot but be concerned for the concerns of his kingdom and glory, especially when he sees them suffering in the world, when he beholds the boar out of the wood, or the wild beast of the forest, open and avowed enemies, wasting and devouring the church of God, when he sees the foxes spoiling the tender vines, and the watchmen wounding, smiting, or taking away the veil of the spouse of Christ, when he sees the privileges of the church of Christ invaded, her doctrine and her worship corrupted, these things, I say, are sinking and oppressing to his spirit. He then hangs his harp upon the willows when he remembers Zion. In this case, he is sorrowful for the solemn assembly, and the reproach of it is his burden. Zephaniah 3, verse 18. And eighth, the poor believer has many times the burden of great crosses and afflictions lying upon him. And these be both of a bodily and spiritual nature. And deep many times calls to deep. The deep of external troubles calls to the deep of inward distress. And these, like two seas, meet together breaking upon him with such violence that the waters are like to come in unto his very soul. Sometimes, I say, he has a burden of outward troubles upon him, perhaps a burden of sickness and pain upon his body, by which the crazy tabernacle of clay is sorely shattered. There is no soundness in my flesh, says David, because of my sin. Sometimes he is burdened with poverty, and want of the external necessities of life, which needs be no strange thing, considering that the Son of God, the heir of all things, became poor and so poor that as he himself declared, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Sometimes he is burdened with infamy and reproach, malice and envy striking at his reputation and wounding his name. False witnesses, says David, rose up against me. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. Sometimes he is burdened in his relations as by their miscarriages. It was a grief of heart to Rebekah when Esau married the daughter of Beri the Hittite. And no doubt David had many a sad heart for the miscarriages of his children, particularly of Ammon and Absalom. Sometimes he is bur burdened with the death of near relations. It is breaking to him when the Lord takes away the desire of his eyes with a stroke. I might here tell you also of many trials and distresses of a more spiritual nature that the believer is exercised with besides those already named. Sometimes he has the burden of much weighty work lying on his hand and his heart is like to faint at the prospect of it through the sense of his own utter inability to manage it, either to God's glory or to his own comfort or the edification of others. This lies heavy upon him till the Lord say to him, as he said to Paul in another case, 
My grace is sufficient for thee. Sometimes the believer in this tabernacle is under the burden of much darkness. Sometimes he is in darkness as to his state. He walks in darkness and has no light, in so much that he is ready to remove the foundation and to cry, I am cast out of thy sight. The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Sometimes he is in darkness as to his duty, whether he should do or forbear. Many a perplexing thought rolls in his breast, till the Lord, by his word and spirit, say to him, This is the way, walk ye in it. Sometimes he is burdened with distance from his God, who seems to have withdrawn from him behind the mountains. And in this case he cries with the church, For these things I weep, mine eye, mine eye runneth down with water, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. And sometimes it is a burden to him to think that he is at such a distance from his own country and inheritance. And in this case, he longs to be over Jordan at the promised land, saying, I desire to be dissolved and to be with Christ, which is best of all. Sometimes again, he is under the burden of fear, particularly the fear of death. We read of some who are held in bondage all their life through fear of death. And yet, glory be to God, such have had a safe landing at last. Thus I have told you some of the things with which the believer is burdened while in the tabernacle of this body. The third thing is to speak of the believer's groaning under his burden. For, says the Apostle, We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. First of all, consider that the working of the believer's heart under the pressures of these burdens vents itself variously, differently. Sometimes he is said to be in heaviness. If need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Sometimes he is said to sigh under his burdens and to sigh to the breaking of his loins. He is said to fetch his sighs from the bottom of his heart. My sighing cometh before I eat, says Job. Sometimes his burdens make him to cry. Sometimes he cries to his God, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Sometimes he cries to bystanders and onlookers, as Job did to his friends. Have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of the Lord hath touched me. Sometimes he is said to roar under his burden. I have roared all the day long, says David, by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Sometimes he is at the very point of fainting under his burden. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Sometimes his spirits are quite overset and overwhelmed. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Sometimes again he is, as it were, distracted, distracted and put out of his wits through the weight of his burdens, especially when under the weight of divine terrors. Thus it was with holy Haman. Or Heman, while I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Yea, sometimes the matter is carried so far that it goes to the drinking up of the very spirits and the drying and withering of the bones. As you see in the case of Job, the arrows of the Almighty are within me, the poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. All the heavy tossing of the believer's heart under his burdens The Apostle here expresses it by a groaning. We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. These groans of the gracious soul, here spoken of, imply a great deal of grief and sorrow of spirit on account of sin and the sad and melancholy effects of it on the believer. While in this embodied state, it also implies a displeasure 
or dissatisfaction in the believer with his present burdened state, he cannot find rest for the sole of his foot here. He finds that this is not his resting place, and it implies a breathing and panting of soul after a better state, even the immediate enjoyment of God in glory. Verse 1. He groans with an earnest desire to be clothed upon with his house, which is from heaven. I proceed to the application of the doctrine. And the first use shall be of information. Hence, we may see the vast difference between heaven and earth. Oh, what vast odds are there betwixt the present and future state of the believer, between his present earthly lodging and his heavenly mansion. This world is but at best a weary land, but there is no weariness in heaven. No, they shall serve him day and night in his holy temple. This world is a land of darkness where you got many a time mourning without the sun. But when once you come to your own country, the Lord shall be thine everlasting light and thy God thy glory. This world is a land of distance, but in heaven you will be at home. When absent from the body, you will be present with the Lord. This world is a den of lions and a mountain of leopards, but there is no lion or leopard there. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all God's holy mountain above. This world is a land of thorns. Many pricking briars of afflictions grow here, but no pricking briar or grieving thorn is to be found in all that country above. This world is a polluted land. It is defiled with sin. But there can be in no wise enter into the land of glory anything that defileth or worketh abomination or maketh a lie. In a word, there is nothing but matter of groaning for the most part here. But all reasons for groaning cease forever there. Also see hence a consideration that many contribute to soothe our griefs, sobs, and groans for the death of godly relatives. For while in this tabernacle they groan being burdened, but now their groans are turned into songs and their mourning into hallelujahs. If our godly friends that are departed could tell us all their hearts, they would be ready to say to us, as Christ said to the daughters of Jerusalem, O oh, Weep not for us, but weep for yourselves. For we would not exchange conditions with you for ten thousand worlds. You are yet groaning in your clay tabernacle, oppressed with your many burdens. But as for us, the day of our complete redemption is come. Our heads are lifted up above all our burdens, under which once in a day we groaned while we were with you. Also see hence that they are not always the happiest who have the merriest life of it in the world. Indeed, if we look only to the things present, the wicked would seem to have the best of it. For instead of groaning, they take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spread their days, they spend their days in wealth and ease. But, O oh, sirs, remember, that it is the evening that crowns the day. The triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment, whereas the groanings of the righteous are but short, and their jubilee and triumph shall be everlasting. I will read you a word that will show the vast difference between the godly and the wicked, and discover or show you the strange alteration of the scene between them in the life to come. It's Isaiah 65, verse 13 and 14. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, 
but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart and howl for vexation of spirit. Also see hence that death need not be a terror to the believer. Why? Because by taking down this tabernacle, it takes off all his burdens and puts a final end point to all his groans. Death to a believer is like the fiery chariot of Elijah. It makes him drop the mantle of his body with all its filthiness, but it transports his soul his better part, into the mansions of glory, the house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, the second use of the doctrine may be of reproof to two sorts of people. First, it reproves those who are at home while in this tabernacle. Their great concern is about this clay tabernacle, how to gratify it, how to beautify and adorn it. Their language is, who will show us any good? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? But they have no thought or concern about the immortal soul, which inhabits the tabernacle, which must be happy or miserable forever. Oh, sirs, remember that whatever care you take about this clay, clay tabernacle, it will drop down to the dust ere long. And the noisome grave will be its habitation, where worms and corruption will prey upon the fairest face and purest complexion. Where will be your beauty, strength, or fine attire when the curtains of the grave are drawn about you? And secondly, this doctrine serves to reprove those who add to the burdens and groans of the Lord's people, as if they were not burdened enough already. Remember that it is a dreadful thing to vex or occasion the grief of those whom the Lord has wounded. They that do so counteract the commission of Christ from the Father, who was sent to comfort them that mourn in Zion, to give them oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, but on the contrary, they study to give a heavy spirit and to strip and rob them of their garments of praise. Remember that Christ is very tender of his burdened saints. And if any offer to lay a load upon their burden by grieving or offending them, the Lord Jesus will not pass it without a severe reproof. And it were better for such that a millstone were hanged about their neck and that they were drowned in the depths of the sea. A third use shall be of lamentation and humiliation. Let us lament that the Lord's saints and people should have so much matter of groaning in this day and time wherein we live. And here I will tell you of several things that are a burden to the spirit of the Lord's people and help on their groaning and make them sad hearts the universal barrenness that is to be found among us at this day is matter of groaning to the Lord's people. God has been at great pains with us both by ordinances and providences. He has planted us in a fruitful soil. He has given us a standing under the means of grace. He has given us line upon line, precept upon precept. And yet, alas, May not the Lord say of us, as he said of his vineyard, I looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. The lamentable divisions that are in our land occasion great thoughts of heart and heaviness to the Lord's people at this day. Court and country, church and state are divided. Ministers divided from their people, and people from their ministers and both ministers and people are divided among themselves, 
and every party and faction turning over the blame upon the other, there cannot be a greater evidence of God's anger or of approaching ruin and desolation. For a city or kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. The innumerable defections and backslidings of our day are a great burden to the Lord's people and make their hearts to groan within them. The charge which the Lord advances against the church of Ephesus may too justly be laid to our door that we are fallen from our first love. There is but little love to God or his people, little zeal for his work and way to be found among us. The power of godliness and the life of religion are dwindling away into an empty form with the most part. And now a word to you who are not burdened in this tabernacle. You never knew what it was to groan, either for your own sins or for the sins of the land in which you live, or the tokens of God's anger which are to be found among us. These are things of no account with them, and they can go very lightly and easily under them. It seems the adamant and flint-like millstone you carry in your breast was never to this day broken by the power of regenerating grace. And therefore, I may say to you, as Peter said to Simon Magnus, ye are yet in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. You are under the slavery of Satan and the curse of the law and wrath of God. And these are heavy burdens, whether you feel them or not. Know it for a certainty that except mercy and repentance interpose, your groaning time is coming. However, you make light of sin now and of things serious and sacred, yet you will find them to be sad and weighty things when death is sitting upon your eyelids and your eye strings are breaking and your souls taking their flight into another world when you are standing trembling as defendants before the awful bar of the great Jehovah. Will you make light of sin then? Or will you make light of it when with the rich man you are weltering among the flames of hell? Oh, consider this, ye that forget God, lest he tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Whether do ye think it is better to groan a while in this tabernacle under the burden of sin or to groan forever under the weight of God's vengeance while in an endless eternity, I would also speak a word to those who are poor, broken, and burdened believers, who are groaning under the weight of these burdens I mentioned. I offer two or three things for your encouragement, with which I shall close, for we are to comfort them that mourn in Zion. No, for your comfort, poor believer, that your tender-hearted father is privy or has knowledge of all your secret groans, though the world know nothing about them. He hears them. Lord, says David, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. As he puts your tears in his bottle, so he marks down your groans in the book of his remembrance. As the Lord hears your groans, so he groans under, <clears throat> he groans with you under all your burdens, for he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, and in all our afflictions he is afflicted. He has the bowels of a father to his children. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Yea, his heart is so tender toward you that it is compared to the tender affection of a mother to her sucking child, and therefore know for your encouragement that you are not alone under your burdens. No, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. 
He bears you and your burdens both. And therefore, though you may pass through the fire and water, yet the fire shall not burn thee. The waters of adversity shall not overwhelm thee. Know also for your comfort that whatever be your burden and however heavy your groanings be, there is abundant consolation provided for you in God's covenant. And here I might go through the several burdens of the Lord's people and offer a word of encouragement to you under each. I shall only touch them passingly. Are you burdened with the body of clay? Perhaps your clay cottage is always like to drop down every day, and this fills you with heaviness. Well, believer, know for your comfort that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, thou hast a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There are mansions of glory prepared for you there, where you shall be forever with the Lord. Are you burdened with the burden of sin, crying, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, here is comfort, believer. Your old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Ere long he will present you to his Father without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Are you burdened with a sense of much actual guilt? Are you crying with David, Mine iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. Well, but consider, believer, God is faithful to forgive thee. For he has said, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Are you burdened with the temptations and fiery darts of Satan? Well, but consider, believer, Christ, your glorious head, the true seed of the woman, has bruised the head of the old serpent. Through death he has destroyed him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And as he overcame him in his own person, so he will make you to overcome him in your person ere long. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Is the society of the wicked your burden? Are you crying, Woe is me that I sojourn in Mesek? Why, consider that you will get other company ere long. When you put off this clay tabernacle, you will enter in among the spirits of just men made perfect. Only stand your ground and be not conformed to the world. Are you burdened with the abounding sins and backslidings of the day and generation wherein you live? Well, be comforted. God's mark is upon you as one of the mourners in Zion. And in the day when the man with the slaughter weapon shall go through, God will give a charge not to come near any upon whom his mark is found. Thou shalt be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Are you burdened with the concerns of Christ, with the interests of his kingdom and glory? Is your heart with Eli's trembling for fear for the ark of the Lord, lest it get a wrong touch? No, for your encouragement that the Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations and that though clouds and darkness be round about him, yet justice and judgment are the habitation of his throne, and mercy and truth shall go before his face. Though his way be in the whirlwind, and his footsteps in the great waters, yet he carries on the designs of his glory, and his church is good. And as for you that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, to whom the reproach of it is a burden. God will gather thee unto himself. He will gather thee unto the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Are you burdened with manifold afflictions in your body, in your state, in your name, in your relations? No, for your comfort, 
God is carrying on a design of love to you in all these things. Thy light afflictions, which are but for a moment, will work for thee a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Are you burdened with much weighty work? Perhaps you know not how to manage this or the other duty, how to adventure to a communion table or the like. Well, for your encouragement, poor soul, the Lord sends none on a warfare upon their own charges, and therefore look to him that he may bear your charges out of the stock that is in thy elder brother's hand, and go in his strength, making mention of his righteousness. Are you under the burden of much darkness, crying with Job, Behold, I go forward, and he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him? Well, be comforted, for unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. Unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And therefore say thou with the church, he will bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. Are you burdened with the Lord's distance from your soul? Because the comforter that should relieve thy soul is far from thee? Lamentations 1 verse 16. Well, be comforted. He will not contend forever. He has promised to return. And lastly, are you burdened with the fear of death? No, for your comfort, the sting of death is gone, and it cannot hurt you. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plague. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Amen.